All right. Welcome back. We're ready to answer some questions and solve some world problems. <laughs> solve some riddles, solve some problems. It's a beautiful, sunshiny day. It's Thursday. It's August 29th, the year. Yeah, it's 2024. Welcome aboard, everybody. You're listening to the Crushing Iron Podcast, and this is episode 794. Yes, and it's uh, panic time for a lot of people in my world. <laughs> It's same for me, man. It's panic time, baby. <laughs> we are 10 weeks out. It's tapering. It's peaking. It's, you know, it's hot. It's cold. It's, it's time to panic. Um, and, but you know, we, but, but speaking of panic, we, we saw both of us yesterday, the new Ironman Chattanooga race course come out. Um, and listen, let, let's just be honest. It could have, it could have been released as 112 exact miles with negative 1,000 feet of gain, and there would have been uproar. There was no way that they were going to put out this new course with now, without total and utter outrage. Because, that listen, that's what triathletes do. We are outraged about everything. We don't like to take, you know, into account X, Y, and Z and, and why, how things got here. You know, a lot of the, at least a lot of the rumor mill is that, you know, they they weren't allowed to go into Georgia or that part of the Georgia, I guess, again, because there was an unpaid balance from the year 2020 that Iron Man was supposed to pay to that part of, of the county. And there's also no race here. I, I'm not going to get into the business politics of that piece, but I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not sure whose side to be on. Like, if there's no race there, why am I paying you money? Um, but so, you know, whatever. They had to change course. Came out yesterday. I mean, you and I have driven on that that highway a ton of times. I mean, I've driven on it almost every day coming back from the hub, every single day um, when we lived there. I mean, it's right on there. And, and only, I mean, I get it, it's three loops, but in my opinion, only triathletes complain when they get four less miles and better pavement, it's, <laughs> it's, it's three. Oh, it's going to be, it's going to be a total cluster. It's going to be unsafe. Like it's you're pretty much close to traffic where you got your one dedicated lane. It's better road conditions by far. And I, I actually think, and I had four people specifically text me yesterday. This is, this may be, a, this gave me a, made me kind of proud and kind of like a little, a little teary eyed as a coach yesterday as a proud moment. I didn't have a single athlete that I coach that's doing Ironman Chattanooga text me about the new bike course with a negative comment. Yeah, I didn't None. either. I did have four other athletes who saw the course and said, I think I might be in for next year. Mm. And I was like, See, you're the kind of person I can get behind here. Optimistic, energized. Give me some more of that. So, yeah, I mean, it. I get it. It's a last course. It's a last minute adjustment, but it's kind of ironic this morning. I was, uh, I did a short little run and then I was walking waffles and I was listening to an interview with Daniela reef who is who retired. And she was talking about the very first time she did Kona. We're talking about the best male or female. If you look at wins and winning percentage, the best triathlete ever. She said the first year she went into Kona that her coach at the time and for the most of the years that she raised, Brett Sutton, didn't let her recon the course. Didn't let her recon the course. Didn't want to get caught up in the terrain and get in her head and take and think it was too much in the moment. He just wanted her to get out there. She got in there like a Tuesday or Wednesday before the race on a Saturday didn't look at the course, didn't recon it, and then just went out there and, and blew the doors off. I think got second that year in her first time. Mm. And yet you've so you got the best in the world who whose coaches are telling them, don't, don't bother with the recon. Just go out there and rip it. And then you got age group athletes who think riding the Rouvet course 17 times on full gas or doing full gas is gonna give them like incredible, you know, insight. And then it goes from 114 miles to 100. Uh, to 112 miles, excuse me, 116 to 112, you're going to get better road pavement. You know, they were complaining about the railroad tracks and St. Elmo, it's horrific to leave town and it's horrific to come back in town. Dude, you're getting, now you're getting like almost perfect pavement throughout the whole thing. Undulating terrain. Yes, you don't go through the national forest, but can we be honest here for a, for a minute? 
when was the last time you're in the in the middle of a race and you look around and you're like, man, this national forest is beautiful. I, you know what? I, this is gorgeous. No, your head's down staring at the pavement. It's kind of like back in the day when they used to say the Louisville run course ran you through Churchill Downs. You're like, that's total bullshit. No one, you could, you take that right out and back turn and you have to like look off the distance with binoculars to see it. Listen, people, it's 112 miles. It's a bike course. It's still, it's a shorter distance. It's better pavement. I think it's going to be exceptionally fast. It'll probably still be safe because I, I probably, it's probably not even 2,000 people doing that race. I think just let's, let's move on. Let's be happy about it. Be jazzed. And I'm telling you, if they keep that, I think it's going to be a winner. Uh, well, you know, I'm as kind of old school as they get with thought processes. And, but the one thing I've always kind of um, leaned towards is more loops. Uh, not necessarily in the bike as much as the run. I've always just felt like, well, I mean, because first of all, I, that's how I train. <laughs> you know, as I used to train at the lab, I'd ride a mile loop uh, like 80 times or whatever. And now I have a two and a half mile loop that I've been kind of dialed into. And, but the, my point is, is that um, I think it would be, obviously it would be um, easier to orchestrate as a race, but uh, it's just, to me, it's more, like there's more opportunity for people around and see you more often and things like that. And there's something I think kind of uh, masochistic about being out at the far point of the Ironman courses and nobody's around, but you know, I've had that happen to me with the, uh, you know, two years ago with that uh, rainy day out at Wisconsin, like I was by myself for a huge portion of that day and it was not fun at all. So it, there's something to be said about having people around while you're racing. And, you know, I know everybody gets like chapped up about the, you know, congestion and things like that. But, you know, you're just out there riding bikes, man. You got to be kind of dialed in and it's sort of more like racing. It feels more like racing than slogging along. So, I don't know. I love the old course out there. And, and frankly, when you come back around from that turnaround uh, way the hell out there and then you go through those horse farms area, I did used to look around a little bit because it is pretty, especially when the sun was rising. and But not a lot, but you're right. It's not like the main thing about, no, I think, I'm doing a race like, is the scenery. It's a, Seriously, no one picked Chattanooga because they're going to ride through the national forest. They picked it because the swim is cake. <laughs> well, can we just be honest for a minute? Like, you know, like, let's not, let's just chill out for just a quick second. Like, yeah. you, you, more people pick this race, you know, because the, the run course is challenging, and it obviously, you know, it's and it's a fast bike course. I listen, I get it, but I also agree with you. Like, I, I'm a huge loop guy. You know this. I mean, hell, I'm the guy that did the century in the lab one time, and you've been out there too. Like, my I'm in Arizona, three loops. You know, Wisconsin, two loops. You know, like the, it's just one more. It's it's crazy. People think like it goes from two loops to three, and all of a sudden now it's like the worst possible thing in the world. You're gonna see more people, and also, and this may sound harsh, if if you're complaining about the safety of because so many so many riders on course, and you haven't ridden outside more than three times this year, then you don't have the right to complain, mm -hmm. because you're part of the problem. If you haven't been riding your bike outside, you don't know how to handle it. You don't don't just don't simply know how to maneuver yourself around other bikes and other people without 100% panicking. That's no one's fault, but your own. And I think a lot of people put a lot of blame on race directors and courses and traffic when, you know, they expect totally closed courses and people to come by giving them 10 feet. Like that's just not real life. Like you need to do your job as an athlete to know how to hold your own line. And when someone says on your left to not immediately look left and then also veer left. I mean, that's just, that happens all the time. I mean, you know, anytime you're passing, you look up the road, I'm more nervous. It's funny because the, the people that are doing the passing, because you, you hear from both sides, like in most time you hear from the people who are getting past, oh, this person came flying by me with like, you know, just give me, give me like, you know, two feet, two feet's a long ass way. And if you're holding your line, that shouldn't bother you. But I can tell you. And usually, like, I find myself on the other end because I'm usually the one getting past because I'm usually out front in the swim. Then all you got left to do is get your ass past. And so that's me. But I've also been on it from, like, a wave start. And when you're doing the passing, you are legit worried that the person in front of you might veer left because mm -hmm. you see them squirming all over the road. They can't hold a straight line. It's very similar to, like, you're on the interstate and you're, you want to pass this person to the left, but you see them, like, constantly veering left or veering right. You can tell they're on their phone. Maybe they're intoxicated, you know, whatever. 
And so you don't, you don't want to pass them. Or if you do, you hammer it and give them more, just a little bit more room. And you, but you hammer it because you want to get by as quickly as possible because you're more afraid they're going to veer left into you than, than hold their own line. And that, that that's, happens all the time on these courses. People ride two abreast. They don't know how to pass. They don't know when to pass. They don't know look how people going behind them. It's just a total lack because that is a pet peeve of mine when someone doesn't say on your left when they're actually coming. It's you know I know it's your favorite thing on the Greenway in Nashville, but well, like if you if you hold, holding your line, you got to hold your line. And it's funny because and I do think that is a, a slight worry. But the, here's the thing: it's it shouldn't be. You know, like you pull up to some. Body. Like sometimes this happens at camps. Like you pull up next to somebody, ask them, and you get within like a foot of them, and they start panicking, mm. and they start like swerving to the left, swerving to the right. You're all tensed up, and that's when you steer terribly. And so I just I think a lot of this responsibility, or at least the, you know, you could be bored by the three loops, and you might not like the change, but it's less mileage, it's perfect pavement. You know, you're gonna get a little more elevation, but I think it's but there's like seven turns, you know, like big big deal. Um, and but again, if you want to if you want to see triathletes struggle, watch them try to make U turns. <laughs> you got people like unclipping and like veering out all the way to the right, using the shoulder on the road, the rumble strips. Like, it's just a hairpin turn. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of this is on us. So there's a lot of things we can complain about that we could also solve without putting the the blame on someone else, as we always do. Yeah. And let me just say, you know, I'm not against saying on your left. What I'm against is because like if I roll up on you. Uh, you know, when I'm in the right lane, I'm just like in the moment. I'm, me- it's almost like I'm meditating, and it's like somebody comes up into my ear, and at the last minute screams on your left. It startles me. Uh, that's really all it is. Is like I try not to startle the people up ahead, and it's like if I was just sitting in meditation and somebody came up and yelled in my face, it would be like shocking. So yeah, just give you know, you got to stay like you're saying in your lane and just be you know, just trust the. I mean, that's the thing, you know. You, it's almost, uh, it reminds me when I used to mountain bike and I would drive, I would go down these hills. It's like, you can't really, you just got to kind of trust your, your line and just stay in your line and, and, and don't think that the person coming up behind you is like trying to do anything to you. They're just trying to go by. That's why I say it's like, don't scream in my ear, just go by me. I'm here in my lane. If I'm going to go left, I'm going to kind of check first. You know what I mean? So, um, anyway, but yeah, it's a, it should be uh how do you hmm? in, in that same vein how do you feel about people that walk around with blow horns and just send them and just like let them off <laughs> i'm not well, i'm not a fan of any sudden sense? loud noise period seriously so no, I, can't, I can't handle it anyway but we can handle our questions for today <laughs> first question uh let's go let me scroll down to find out where we uh where we left off again we'll try to get to these but it's weird because like facebook's algorithm um you never even know you never know what's in order and what's happened and then they like re they redo everything um because they know what's best so, man for you yeah they exactly and they, they know a lot about what's best all right well, you know what i'm gonna do i'm just gonna pop down to the bottom all right who are we gonna get started with Oh, it's waffles. Excuse us. Um, all right. Ooh, here we go. Perfect. Right up, right up your alley. Jeff Marin, have you ever wanted to try some form of unorthodox training for someone training for an Ironman? <laughs> Something most people who say, huh, that will never work. I'll let you take it away on this one. Well, uh, the answer is yes. Um, I do that all the time now. <laughs> so we're going to find out how that goes. But, um, I think at the crux of what I'm trying to figure out always is uh, how to, you know, get to the point I need to get to without, quote unquote, all the traditional approach. Um, I've always been a a fan of cross training, you know, and when I started, I I think it all stems from this. Uh, When I got, when I was getting into, you know, endurance sports, the first thing I started doing was running, right? So I did the 5K, 5-mile, 10K, half marathon progression. And I had never, I mean, I, I, could, I was in better shape, obviously, but I was sore constantly. So I found out about triathlon and then started doing uh, that type of thing and did some, and I started feeling a hell of a lot better. But at some point, the same kind of thing happened to me. So I was looking for how to cross train, cross train the cross train. 
And so I, I'm always doing stuff like that now. Um, you know, it's just sort of like, what is a great little supplement? And, you know, I've, I've, I'm way down in total volume, length, long rides, long runs, but I, I don't know about volume as much as just the long, long stuff. Um, so we'll see, you know, um, we'll see. Yeah. I, 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 I'm a fan of it, to be honest. And it's not like some kind of like um, hack or something like that. I'm just always trying to feel good. And sometimes when I'm deep, deep, deep into going straight forward all the time, that becomes uh, a pain on my body. So I think for me, that's really the, the crux of it is just trying to always feel better and feel younger as I get older. Yeah, I mean, I think honestly, like everyone should – experiment i mean I, I do it and i mean i do it on myself i do it on athletes i've got athletes that have been like hey i know you like to experiment experiment on me like i think it's fun <laughs> and, and the thing is is like you know people say and, you know they might say oh it's you can get an unorthodox way i'm like well if it works for you then is it unorthodox like it might be compared to like the general population or what you see most people you know portraying the training is like but the only thing that matters is you and how you like it and your training. So like, I mean, listen, there's been tons of, you know, circumstances, life injuries, you know, like things that happen where like as a coach, you just have to like, you don't have to reinvent the wheel, but you just got to take a, you got to take your shot and be like, listen, the only way we're going to get this done is if we do this. So you, you have to be very creative. And I mean, and this is, there have been, I've had this conversation with, I think you before and some of our other coaches, but like sometimes if you, if you take the orthodox way to train some people, right. And, and this is just, this is just a fact of life and a fact of, of where people are on their athlete life cycle. And really it's more of a, a, um, a symptom of like, so a lot of times it's bad decision-making when they come to sign up for races, is you, you find yourself six to seven weeks out, eight weeks out from, you know, say an Ironman, for example, and, you know, athlete A has just like skipped all their, you know, skipped so much. And they're, they're like, hey, you know, like, you know, can we, can I still make it? You know, can I still do this? And you're like, well, we can, right? But we have to do this. And the answer is we're going to swim a ton and we're going to bike a ton and we're going to get you in the position where you can get off the bike and you can walk the finish. All we got to do is get you off the bike in enough time. And if, but if you, and that, I might, and that's, is that like high performance coaching? It, it, you know, by definition, like, are they going to podium? No, but you're, but as a coach, like you have to put almost more detail into figuring out just to get them across the finish line in the time threshold. That's actually in a lot of ways, a lot harder than training someone who's consistent and motivated and, you know, overly athletic and has great, you know, um, ability to be consistent and is and injury free. Like a lot of times those are, you have a little more wiggle room with those people, right? You know, sometimes their genetics and their DNA can kind of make up for maybe a mistake you might make here and there. But with athletes who like are on the verge of, of finishing or, or, you know, reaching their goals, like you, you can't take the orthodox approach because the orthodox approach would be, you know, comparatively speaking to most, like, you know, if they're going to grab the old B iron fit book off the Amazon shelf and go on out and doing two and a half, three hour runs, they're never going to see that their longest runs going to be in training because they're never going to make it off the bike or they're never going to make it out of the water. They might not even make the first 50 mile cutoff because they didn't swim enough. And so like if you take, if you always take traditional, you're, you're going to have athletes that it sticks to and then athletes that it doesn't stick to. Right. And so you, you have, I mean, as a coach, like you have to always be willing to be, to think outside the box and think, how can I get this at the most out of this athlete between now and, and, and race day. And it's, it's not the easiest thing in the world. It's, it's, it's really actually quite challenging. Um, but it's just one of those things that you've got to be willing to do. And then I think a lot of coaches aren't willing to do that because they're scared of what the result might be. So, but it's, but if you stick to what you've always done, then you can kind of blame the athlete for not doing it. But the goal of the coach is to, if you need to reinvent the wheel, you reinvent the wheel, right? You don't want to make it a square so it can't work, but there's always got to be a way to, I think, and, and as a coach, and I you're the same way, like that really gets my, it gets my juices flowing. Like I like a really good 
challenge of like a race schedule or back to back races or stay like I like a good, good challenge like that because it's it's new and it's challenging and it's it's I think it's it gets you excited, you know, um, and, it, and, it, and it keeps you on your toes as a coach. Yeah, for sure. And um, as I, as I get older and I've been through this through, through my whole 50s and everything, so I just have a, a approach about this. I mean, my goal is, uh, you know, keeping people healthy and finding long term enjoyment in the sport. I mean, that's been my goal. I want to do that for other people that want to do that and just feeling not only healthy, but just almost feeling better than as we get older. So, you know, in a way I'm really honestly in a process of reinventing everything, you know, a lot of my coaching style and practices right now. I just, I'm, I'm in the test. I'm in my own lab right now doing stuff like that and um, feeling pretty good about it. You know, it's, you know, I I wonder sometimes if like, you know, as I grew up and one of my favorite movies was Rocky and that first one where Mickey had him chasing chickens and pounding on frozen meat, you know, like taking him out into these weird things. It's like, those kind of things have always been really cool to me and not like I'm going to have people doing that, but we can uh, simulate things like that, I guess that, that apply to triathlon. But I, I just find it fascinating, you know, and it's like, um, sometimes you can just sit there and you can buy a plan and it's just laid out in this way and it just seems so sterile or something. And, um, uh, I, I think more than ever at this point in the world or something, we need to figure out ways that make us feel healthy um, that, that are good for our body and our soul and, and that sort of thing. So that's really where my head is at with coaching right now. And I'm, I, um, you know, it, it's that fine line, right. That we walk because we want to make sure people are ready to do exactly what they're trying to do. Um, and you know, sometimes like without experience in these things and that's, I'll always see, you know, I can tell people, that they're ready to go and they don't necessarily believe it. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, I think that's the thing about what we've been doing for, you know, 10 years and you a little more on the coaching, but like with the podcast and coaching and seeing so many different situations, we've been exposed to so much that we know, you know, just through experience, I guess, what things work and when, you know, what are the signs and what, what are we looking for, you know, as far as like, people's mental and, and, uh, physical space and getting them in the right place to do these races. And it, 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 and it's not like, I think in a lot of ways when we get into those data things, and that's why I get so kind of disrupted by that is that it's, it's so much deeper than that. I mean, I think, you know, I'll have pre-race discussions with athletes and we'll go through things that, you know, we work, we have to work with what we have, right? With, with what's there. And we always talk about how mental a, a race can be. And if we can get your mindset, for example, and, you know, along the way, even train you more for that mental approach and, or whatever, I think those things are like huge, you know, it's like building confidence and building understanding of what is going on. So there's a lot of different ways to get there. And, uh, I'm really excited about this question actually in this topic yeah and i and listen i think it's um you know one of the biggest frustrations for me i think as a coach in in looking at the sport right and i know we're getting sidetracked here but i think it's an important discussion um you know is you know there's already a a huge obstacle and brand problem when it comes to triathlon you tell people triathlon and you immediately think you know that this right like they immediately think iron man right i can't train for that then look at how much you know then i need a tri bike i can't afford that you get wheels i can't afford that like it's already got huge barriers to entry so it, it puts people off from even trying and then you look at people's lives now and how different they are, they may or may not be and how busy they are then they look at you know, maybe they don't know what coach to get or what training plan. They look online and every single training plan looks the exact same, right? It's all laid out like it's like that's just like that you, you know, if you're working off training plans and you know they don't work or, you know, or they're not working for you or you're trying to find a way to maneuver things around, you know, like the the sport's expensive enough. There's a lot of ways to invest 
in getting your best return. And a lot of that doesn't have to do with a headache. It could be working off a, you know, a structured plan that's made just for you, right? Or having a coach by your side. Like experimenting is great. And and I think a lot of people just assume, you know, like long runs gotta be done on Sunday. False. Long rides gotta be done on Saturday. False. Right? Uh, you got to do this distance run to be ready for the finish line. False, right? You can, like there's so many of these people that think there's prerequisites to being ready to race that are just 100% totally false. You know? Yeah. I mean, that's why, like, you know, we're a huge fan of the double ride. Like, no offense, but you know, you, you and you always tell people, like, hey, why are we not doing the long run this week? I'm like, well, you looked at Sunday. Did you look at Wednesday? And I'm like, oh shit. I'm like, yeah, like, you know, you can tell an athlete to do to go to the pool for an hour. And it's just this thing. Right? I can tell you to go to an hour and 15 minutes and swim on Wednesday morning. And you don't think anything about it. But it's going to take you 15 minutes to get there. Walk in five minutes. There, there, there's 20. The swim is an hour and 15, hour, hour and 35 minutes to get home and shower. It's two hours, right? Minimum. If it's an hour and 15 minutes swim, most of the time it's longer than that. And you get st- you get stuck by, you know, Tricub Tim, who wants to talk about all the upcoming races and, and how things are going. I give you a little bit of tip on your swim form. Like everybody knows that guy. That's two hours. You know, your long run, you could leave from your house and knock out your long run on a, on a, on a Saturday or excuse me, on a Wednesday morning and be done with it. And then the weekend when you have more free time, right, get in multiple rides or pick your longest days, you know, or like there's, there was a block that I've done for quite a few, like for Almost every athlete that I've got doing Wisconsin, I had him do a really, really hard bike on a Tuesday morning, very hard bike, PM run, like 45 minute PM run, Wednesday morning, longer, like hour and 15, depending on who it was, to up to an hour and 30, like tempo run. And then in the evening again, we're another 45 minutes. So in a, in a, in a 24 hour span, they're running almost three hours that included with a little bit of extra time, right? So maybe like 36 hours to two hours. We're including a, um, uh, a bike. Like, you know, like that's, you don't, I mean, sure. That, that might be in like a few training plans, but that's called unorthodox, right? Because, but when you look at it, it's not right. Or you do the, and you do the same thing. Like there's, there's just so many ways to, to, to make things and make athletes successful, you know, it can be frequency. It could be five, six, seven runs a week that are all short and sweet, right? Same thing with swimming, or it could be three runs a week and they're all hour and 15 minutes or more. And there's no 40 minute runs. Like there's just so many ways to, again, like I don't, I don't know that there's an orthodox is just what's out there and offered there, but there's always a way to be creative. And, and I th- honestly, and I know you feel the same way. It's like, that's what makes your job fun, right? Is, you know, like wh- what can make it work? How can we make it work? You know, y- and you might hate long runs or you might hate, you know, long rides. So how can we make it exciting and still get the volume in and the intensity and in that we need to be successful on race day? That's mm. the fun of it. Yeah, it is. And I mean, I always think back to when we started and the, how I felt, you know, about, it seemed impossible the whole time, and uh, I think I've talked to you about this many times, but how, you know, some of my athletes, they, they definitely just want that six-hour ride or a couple of them or those super long runs and things like that, but, you know, coming from experience and, and what we went through, I mean, you forced me to do a 100-mile ride before my first one that one time because we were all out there and it was just in the flow of the moment, but I would have bagged <laughs> hundred percent. I don't know if that made the difference. I mean, you know, I don't remember how far it was out from the race, probably a month or so, but, um, I just was at the point where I'm like, I know I got 80 and I can feel the next 32 or whatever. And I just it, I'm fine with that. You know, it's like, I know it's going to suck on race day. You know, I'm going to have my neck hurting and hold, you know, it's just going to be that. So it's like, uh, you know, but sometimes people want to do it. So I'm, I'm just trying to like, and I'm sure you do this too. You kind of, you put out options and here we are, you know, and like you're saying, if you, if you give them a, <clears throat> a pretty substantial bike ride on, on Friday, for example, and then they go out and do a long ride, it's like, all right, we're layering that shit up. And like, I think that's the <clears throat> most interesting part to me is how things layer. And I, I made a decision earlier on this summer to be more on the bike frequently than really thinking about too many long rides. And I don't know, we're going to see how this shit pans out, man, but. 
I feel like, uh, like you said, there's just a lot of different ways to approach it. And I'm just interested in it because, you know, frankly, Ironman training can turn into your life. And, you know, I think we see it a lot right now, especially before a big race where, you know, people are just hitting this wall of uh, like questions and burnout and anxiety and all this kind of stuff. And <clears throat> I just personally don't necessarily think that's, uh, for me, a healthy approach to life because <laughs> it just is like mm -hmm. it becomes part of your life every year for like a three or four week stretch or something like that and um it weighs you down and then you kind of go through it and we've already said that you know that the whole process should be the reward even though you know crossing the finish line feels amazing but the, and then you see you know people get through it and then it's like oh, i'm bummed man i don't know what to you know it's like it's not the point the point is to feel good and to um, enjoy what you're doing. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, that's, that's the fun of it, man. Um, so let's not get too derailed. Uh, Charlie Kittrell, I'm looking to join a team to get more out of my training and races. I live on the Gulf coast in Alabama and there isn't any local teams that would benefit the average Joe triathlete. I'm interested in joining C26. What could I expect from a team like this, especially from for someone like myself in my late forties and back of the Packers this club for anyone to join. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, we're probably not the ones our athletes can chime into this, but I mean, we're like, we just went to, you know, first of all, we've got athletes all over the country. I know we, I think we even, I'm almost certain we have some in the Gulf Coast area. So we got athletes all over, and you know, you're, you're the community is, I mean, the community is worth the price of admission, you know, and we have, you know, I always use last year Ironman Wisconsin as an example. I mean, we had an athlete, a C26 athlete in the top 10 overall finishers. And we had an athlete in the last 10 overall finishers and everyone in between. I mean, that, that's just, you know, that's, that's who we work with. Right. And to this kind of the same point on a training standpoint, like I love working with, and I know you do too. Like it, it's, it's fun to work with all levels of athletes. It keeps you on your toes keeps you having to think through, you know, like you get, you, you, I, I thoroughly enjoy, I love working with athletes at the pointy end and athletes at the back end and everyone in between. Cause I think it makes you a better coach. Cause you constantly have to be, you, you can't get set in your ways cause something's always different and changing, right. You know, youngest, you know, younger one, older one, you know, we've got athletes in their early twenties. We've got athletes in their eighties. You know, we've got tons of females, you know, we've got tons of males. We've got, you know, pointy end, you know, elite age group, you know, females and males, we've got back of the pack, we got middle of the pack. I mean, and then on the community aspect, like you, you get out of it, what you want to get out of it. You can come to camps and meet and make 40, 50 best friends, you know, like Louisville, we had, you know, for 50, 60 people there cheering each other on, hanging out after the race, you got team races, you know, or, you know, you can, I mean, I've, there's athletes that I've worked with for, I think seven years. I've never met in my life. Never met had maybe like three phone calls like they just they, they they just want training they want to be successful they don't want anything else they just want really good coaching so i think you can look for you know on the c26 side you can look for great coaching or you can look for for great coaching and community it's just really more about like what fits your personality but you know from a, a team that you know spans the the country it's a very close close-knit group of people yeah no i agree with that and i think it's um there's, I've always felt like, because I, I did come and I still remember coming into the triathlon world out of nowhere, even the endurance world. And I started with a running club and you remember this and, uh, it locally and it kind of was all right, but then you kind of just realized that, I don't know, like with the tri clubs locally, sometimes, <clears throat> you know, they have a, I guess a personality and sometimes it, it isn't always in line. We have a lot of like-minded people and I don't know how to define that necessarily, but if you come to a camp, for example, and out of the blue, and I just, I've seen it so many, be, people come in and they just feel like at home sort of, you know, even if they're, you know, nervous about coming in with, you know, 30, 25, 30 new people or whatever. And everybody in the club, same with on the race course. I can't tell you how many times I've heard this, that, Hey man, I was, uh, you know, I'm just new and we just started working together, but C26, like the other athletes and the fans are what got me through this race. <laughs> it was like, you know, it's just the, you know, the connection and the support 
that rolls around it is just kind of un, undefinable, but it's, it's pretty, it never ceases to amaze me. You know, it's like, I think it's one of those things where, you know, when I started in the sport and I'd walk up to somebody else with like a fancy Jersey on some team from somewhere else or whatever. And I'd start talking, it was like, almost like, eh, I don't know. You're not welcome necessarily, but I feel like everybody in our group is just super welcoming, man. I, I, I know you've seen that. Anybody can walk up to anybody and just kind of, they'll help you out, you know? So I don't know what that means. <laughs> the best just, compliment we can get. Yeah. You know, we saw a lot of your athletes and they were, you know, just good people. So yeah, that's, that's the best awkward pitch we can, we can give. <laughs> I know um, let's see. Jeff Terra, any thoughts on Boston qualifying times this year for us runners? My triathlon races are complete and have one more marathon before the BAA registration. Creation opens in a few weeks. Will five minutes below your qualifying time be enough? I don't know. <laughs> I got no idea, dude. Um, I mean, most people, I mean, we always have quite a few at Boston each year, and and they always like to aim for, you know, aim for 10 below because it'll probably be five below, and that gives you a buffer, but also gives you, you know, wiggle room to, to not make it. But then again, like, you know, I – I always have a tough one this one because I don't train by pace, even for our Boston athletes, because if you can do it, you can do it. And if you can't, you can't. Right. And, and it, it makes sense or it doesn't make sense. And when people train by pace, they, they overrun, they overtrain and they, and, and they don't know how to do it and they end up hurting themselves. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, to me, when you train an athlete for Boston to qualify, you you try to, you train them to get the most out of them. Just because they want to qualify for Boston, they need a qualifying time. Doesn't mean they're ready. Doesn't mean they're going to get there in time. And doesn't mean if they chase a pace, they're going to get there. So, I mean, from a pace standpoint, you know, ten minutes is usually pretty good um, to guarantee you. But you know, they're letting in like record numbers these days. I think so. Um, you never know. Yeah, that's interesting, man. Because that's a big one, right? The pace. Um training and even we'll put in workouts sometimes is, you know, today run at your half marathon effort or whatever. And, mm -hmm. and, and somebody will be like, well, the last half marathon I ran was two years ago. My pace was, I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> your effort. You have to, yeah. you know, understand what that is right now. Like, all right, dial in, you know, and I, that's how I am a hundred percent with, I'm, I'm just usually so, so much an effort person and, and it, it, for me, that can often mean just, all right, what, what feels like I can run a half marathon right now. And some days that's faster and some days it's slower, but I have to be okay with that depending on the conditions and the work I've done the day before and or whatever. So yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know anything about really the, the cutoff thing. I haven't, you know, dove into that. Yeah, I mean, too honestly, hard. it doesn't matter. You, you can, tr you can train and get as fast as you possibly can and then you see where you end up and then you guys still got to race well. Uh, let's see. Let's do Allie Pryor. I've just finished a sprint duathlon world champs that I train hard for and swinging straight into 70.3 in four weeks. How can I best use that very short time to get ready for that distance? My long runs every week are 15 kilometers, no bigger distances than 40 kilometers on the bike and no swimming really at all. I've done many 70.3s in the past, so it's not my first. Um, yeah. I always have a hard time with this one because <laughs> it's kind of the same thing about what you just said. <laughs> like I've done many 70.3s in the past, so it's not my first. Okay. Well, that's all great and fine and all, but like when was the last one you did? And if you haven't swam in a while, then you're not in 70.3 shape. You know, if you haven't, and I just, that's a huge deal. Um, and if I'm you, I'm swimming three to five days a week. I'm staying on the bike and I might include just a little bit longer. I mean, that's it because you're, you're running and, you're running and riding fitness you've gained is going to mean absolutely nothing if you get out of the water absolutely smoked. And and so I, I would put it in the swim. It's like, and it's, you, know, so, you know, when is the past? Is that the past is in like past late last year in October? Or is that past is in like 2021? Because if it's then, then it's irrelevant. You know, it's like your, your fitness is irrelevant from then. You know, I've done a lot of 70.3s and fulls, but you know, if I asked you asked me to line up at Wisconsin, I'd get my freaking ass destroyed. So, I mean, yeah, I would focus on the swim um, because, again, you're, you're, you know, that's that's like a hard conversation you always have as a coach with like people who come into triathlon from a marathon background. They want to train the same, 
and they always consider those really great runners and can't figure out, you know, why they can't run the same in a race. I'm like, well, it's because you don't swim a bike enough. Like, you've got a weapon, and I know all you want to do is run because that's what you do. And that you're a, you're a runner and you're a marathoner, but it's going to mean absolutely nothing. Yeah. If, you, if you can't get off the bike fresh, it means zero. If you can't get out of the swim, it means zero. So uh, that would be my my suggestion is really, really, really focus on the swimming you know, bike volume is easy. I mean, you could you could bump up from an hour and a half bike to three hours, and it would do no damage. You, it might be hard on your on your rear end and your legs, but no structural damage. I mean, you're you're pedaling in a circle with no impact. You know, you're you're in a fixed point. Um, increasing the long run would be the 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 difficult part. Um, in four weeks is not a lot of time, but you probably only need like four or five day taper. I mean, you don't you don't need a two week taper. You need to probably swim four or five days race week anyway just to keep the fuel for the water yeah i mean you t- that's exactly what i would think i mean i'm personally in a i wouldn't say it's a s- similar situation but like when i when i say i'm not doing a lot of volume i'm you know putting my uh cards into the swim a lot more because of what you're just saying i think uh you know if you haven't been swimming certainly you want to get that to a point where you you can take that out of the equation and not be completely wiped out and or worried about it. So I would just swim like a mad woman right now. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, just bike a little bit more. And, and, and when you're running, just kind of be sorting for that. Like, okay, I've been doing shorter runs, but what could I effort, could I dial in to be going longer and hopefully feel good off the mm-hmm. bike? Yep, 100%. Uh, let's see. Now I'm just being picky here. Uh, I'm going time for all of them. Um, let's go with old Jeffrey Payton. My Planning man. to do St. George 70.3 May of 2025. Hard to find a race prior to to dust off the cobwebs. And am cautious about St. George being my first race of the year. Try a city of 70.3 in September would be my last triathlon, considering participating in Oceanside as a training race, especially for the cold swim and hilly bike. Thoughts on using a race to prepare for another race. I imagine others are trying to figure out the best prep for St. George. So thanks for your, your thoughts. Yeah, you know, the, er, listen, I, I think early season, early season races, April, May, and then late season races, end of October, November, I think are the hardest races of the year. Yeah, the early season races, you don't have any, you know, real time, to, like you said, to get in a, a, an alternate race to, you know, dust off the the cobwebs, right? Um, you know, you or excuse me, or like like yeah, the early season hit out, like everybody needs to call them. Like you don't have the, those opportunities. Um, and then you're also training indoors, right? For a lot of it, so you don't have time to be on your bike outside or, or do open water swims or do a lot of. Again, and riding and running, you know, depending on where you live to prepare for the course. So it's challenging. Same thing goes for late season races, right? It's just, it's so long. You're in, especially when people start their, their build for it, you know, too early. You know, we see us all the time when we pick up athletes who bought like a, a 20 week training plan or a 30 week training plan. And you're like, dear God, that sounds like a long countdown. So no wonder you're disinterested, right? Or you get lost along the way. It seems like you're freaking, you know, traversing the freaking Sahara and you're only allowed to go an inch at a time with your, with blindfolded. Like it just, it's a long and your season is like peaking and guess what everybody else is doing? What I'm doing this weekend, watching the U S open and college football with, with no long ride on the schedule, no long run. The weather's perfect. We're out doing, you know, barbecues and hanging out, going to games, watching football all day. What are you doing? You're out there on the bike with shaming cream up your rear end, trying to shove 19 gels down your throat at 5 a.m. on a Saturday. Yep, those are hard days. Crying because What's your friends. You're crying because your friends are somewhere else. Exactly right. <laughs> doing no trainings alone and it sucks. But I do this. I'm like, well, you told you not to do this, you know, but you signed up anyway. So those are always two really, really hard times a year, right? So timing is everything. It, what I and I, I just suggested this to an athlete. I don't know Monday. They're training for uh, a 70.3 in a few weeks, and they've had just some very, very difficult life circumstances. They haven't met. I mean, it's they're they're the, they're the athlete that you see who you know is going through just tremendous stress at home, and yet they still show up every day 
and get a workout in and take care of themselves. And like, to, to me, like those are the ones that you think of like, like you, you're, you're the perfect example of, of getting things done. And they just said, Hey, like, you know, I, I, I gotta be honest with myself. There, there's no way I can do this race and travel and be away from home. I just can't do it. Uh, and I said, that's, 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 that's fine. No, no big deal. I said, but I want you to think about hopping on your bike on Zwift and doing a 56 mile effort and then hopping off and running a 13.1 just to get out there and do something. You know, I, I did that when Texas 70.3 got canceled when it was repositioned from April to November in 2020, you know, I was heading, I was in my car on my way down there to race and probably the best shape of my life. And the race got canceled, turned around, came home, Stopped at Cracker Barrel on the way back into Chattanooga, had my pre-race breakfast, went home, relaxed, got the next day, went into the hub, hammered a 56-mile route on Swift, and hopped on the treadmill to run 13.1. Hey, I didn't do, I didn't swim, but and it was really, really gratifying. And it was a true test of my fitness. Like, was it a, was it a race? No. But it was, you know, and it wasn't a race simulation. I wasn't trying to simulate. I was just, I wanted to test myself over the length of time I had. So I think that's that's things for people to consider if you're, if you don't, because there's a lot of stress and cost, right? Like in going to, you know, SoCal just for a training race to knock out, you know, cold water or hills, like hills you can practice on the bike, get outside on your mountain bike or fat tire bike, you know, do some cold water immersion, you know, some cold plunges, like that gets you used to the cold, get used to it. There's ways to train for that or, and just maybe prepare, you know, pick a date and like, I don't know, you know, let's see if a race is in, in May, maybe pick a time in March, right. To, to do a, you know, uh, your own little weekend, or if you want to do like a, an actual half marathon race, pick a half marathon race on a Sunday. And then on Saturday, just dominate and go out and crush a ride. So you go into the race with a little bit of fatigue, right. And just kind of treat it as maybe do like a, a big sp- swim on Friday, you know, big swim Friday, hammer the 56 miles on, on Saturday. Will it be the same as a race simulation or a actual race? No, but one, it'll be cheaper. Okay. It'll be cheaper. You're at home. Things are more controlled, right? And you'll recover a lot quicker and get right back into training, you know, and you should be able to gather something through it. So uh, there's always opportunities like that. I think to kind of, again, test yourself, see where you are without, always making sure it's a race that gives you like, you know, the green light, the yellow light or the red light. Yeah, I agree with all that. I mean, I work with Jeff, so it's like, we'll figure something out, man. And, uh, that's the first thing I was thinking. of was like, you know, getting in some running races and keeping things kind of tuned up, but we do a lot of Jeff and I do a lot of non-traditional approach as well. So we'll figure it out and, and, uh, get it going, get it going. All right, we can probably squeeze one more in here. Um, I'm skipping over Jason uh, Bustle's question, uh, and I still don't know how to have it in me for it yet. Um, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> no, I can't do it. I just can't do it. Um, Heather House, uh, what's the goal of the off season? Build strength, work on power. How do you use the off season to make yourself faster next season? The goal of the off season is is what do you need to work on the most? You know, and, and again, like there's, as a coach, like, you know, we get these questions a lot and going back to the very first question we had that put us on a tangent with the unorthodox, right? Mm-hmm. You know, as everybody has, oh, in the off season, we, we, we got, we go back to strength training and we, we do off season base work and we do this, 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 and this. And, and I'm like, well, what if that's not what you need? What if you need something else? You know, like you you have to identify what it is you need to work on and then commit this conversation earlier today it wasn't about racing and training it was about life they just athlete just asked me i kind of called them out and they said all right well, what do you suggest and i said well i suggest you do these things one identify what it is you want two make a plan on how to accomplish that three get to work on executing that plan pretty simple steps, right? You can take that, those same three steps and basically copy and paste that to everything in life and get somewhere. So identify, go into your question, identify what it is you need to improve on. Two, make a plan on how to get there. Three, get to work on that plan. And so, but the, the hard part is, is 
one, and we talked about this, I think last week is one, a lot of people don't really understand what their weakness is or where they need to work on it. So they, they kind of swing at a pinata and miss and pick something that they don't need to do. Right. Or then they, they know exactly what it is. They need to, I need to work on my swim. And I mean, I'll just be 100% honest. This is, I see this all the time. I've seen it right now in the online swim school. So that, our, today is our last week. The online swim school will do another one starting in October 1st. So we'll do registration opening up here in a week or two. Had a ton of success. But you know, the, the, the success has been all from the people who have stuck with it and done their, their swims every week. We've had everybody who's done their swims every week has seen massive gains. The ones that haven't all either quit, okay, or went down to doing like one or two, maybe every once in a while. Like this is, and, and that's not to be like harsh. That's just, that's with all things in life, right? It's very easy to make a plan. Everyone loves a good plan, right? You can walk in, we used to joke about this. Every Starbucks in America is littered with, you know, the next entrepreneur with the, with the next biggest, greatest idea, you know? But one, do they have the ability to execute it? Do they have the risk tolerance to make it happen? The two, those two are, answers are usually no, right? So it never happens. Same thing with athletes. You know what you need to work on. That's the easy part. Even the, the, then the second easy part is making the plan. The third and the most critical and hard, but also hardest part is executing and getting it done. So, and that's what I've seen again in, in, in swimming is like people always want to get better but then they don't put the work in. But the ones that put the work in have just, it's been a massive success. But then it's also been not a success for the ones that don't do the work. So, you know, for off season, again, there is no, or, there is no unorthodox or orthodox, right? There is what's mainstream and what's main for you. And so you identify, hey, what do I need to work on, right? And then also the plan of how to work on it needs to be an attainable plan, Right. You see us all the time as coaches when they say, you know, load me up or I can handle this. You know, the same the same conversation earlier or, or this week with an athlete. You know, what do you think is my biggest my biggest limiters? And I said, I think your biggest limiter is sticking with a goal and not changing your goal every two weeks. You, you can you can attain. I believe anyone can attain a goal, but it's your attention span that has kept you from meeting your goals because every two or three weeks you want a new goal. All you got to do is, is I, I, I totally believe this. Every athlete, every person can achieve whatever it is you want to achieve if you have the tolerance to stick with it. It's just time. All it is is time. But that's why we give up. You and I were joking about it before we went live today talking about Amazon, right? Like, you're like, oh, God, I got to wait till tomorrow to get this? Ugh. It's ridiculous, right? You can have shit in like two hours, right? Mm -hmm. I could ask for, you know, a new set of, you know, <laughs> tubeless tires before we went live in the podcast and when we're done, walk downstairs and grab them up my doorstep. You know, like we just, we don't have the tolerance anymore for, you know, for waiting. And that's why people don't reach their potential because you get distracted or you, you, you change course so often you don't have the, and you're talking about you're going like the risk tolerance, you know, you don't have the tolerance to wait and be patient for it to get right. And and that's just a, a huge, huge piece of it. You know, I, I've never met an athlete that's put the work in and not been successful. But I, I but I've got I and I work with athletes like this. And I have, you know, and I've worked in the past that it's always different. It's a different goal every two or three weeks, and they can't ever figure out why they can't get to their goals. I'm like, that's because you've had 19 this year. Like you, you have to stay the course. And I, and I flat out told this to this athlete earlier this week. I said, you, you, you know, I, I wrote, I wrote it down in steps, you know, step one is this step two is this step three is to do one consistently. And step four is to do two consistently. And then number five, I wrote, nothing would make me happier than to see you achieve this goal, but it's going to take you 18 months. So do you have that kind of bandwidth and patience to be consistent in doing it? Because Eight weeks ago, you had a totally different goal. And that's fine. Athletes do this all the time, right? When they're when they're when they're searching to get out of a funk or they're searching for ways to be excited, athletes go usually to the extremes, right? And again, we talked about this before we went live today. They swing on that pendulum of I'm way up 
and I'm way down. Right. And so, you know, I, I think, you know, again, like when you're looking at a quote unquote off season or, or what it's supposed to be, like, what do you need it to be? And then are you willing to put the time in, in the, in what I think again is the hardest time of year. It's dark when you wake up, it's dark when you go to bed, it's cold. No one wants to go to the pool. It's not that fun to run outside when it's cold, unless you love it. You know, you're going to be stuck biking inside. So what is the right answer? And so I think, you know, taking, taking time to, to search through that is, is more before is more important than actually putting the pen to the paper to make the plan because a plan is only as good as your ability to execute it. Uh, I, yeah, man. Um, uh, what I think it, we tend to do things more that we're good at. And a lot of times the off season kind of puts that, what do we want to work? What do we need to work on to get better? And I was just thinking, I was just kind of jotting out some notes about like, you know, out of a hundred percent of triathletes, uh, I would guess that <clears throat> roughly 10% of them love swimming, 40% love cycling and 50% love running or something like that because it just comes easier. I think, I think it's almost in that scale. It kind of goes up in that scale or down in that scale because what does it take? I mean, I've talked about this a million times as an adult onset swimmer is like, you know, you and a lot of other people grew up swimming for hours, man. And you said it, man, it is uh, with the swim school is like, it takes a lot to get better at swimming. And are you going to be able to get in there and cause think about the, how much that could take out of people's angst. If people just became a really good swimmer and they were comfortable getting in the water, you know, for example, but do you take, do you, need, do you have what it takes, like you said, to focus on it and actually work on things without hitting your lap button every damn time to see if you're getting faster, you know, and then being disappointed along the way. So, yeah, I mean, I, it is a, to me, it's a, it's a tricky puzzle. Um, you know, we want to get stronger, but, you know, do you really want to like work the core muscles and things like that really kind of benefit or you just want to get jacked? you know, just to feel like you're strong. I mean, like, you know, doing super, super heavy stuff to actually feel like you're strong. And I think sometimes that can be our subconscious talking. It's like, I want to get better, but I feel weak a lot when I train. I feel weak a lot. And I, to me, that's like a balance between, you know, everything between hydration, nutrition, and having uh, connective muscles that are strong enough to handle the triathlon program is that what you want to be a triathlete or you want to like look good or you know like jack up all these types of things I think we have to really figure out like you said set a, a genuine goal and then work on it for mm, three months like little things you know mm -hmm. I always like talk about my analogy with drumming I used to have to do shit that I would drive me crazy just to get to another level you know but I have to you have to master certain basics before you're going to get better in all this stuff and the basics mm -hmm. sometimes are the things that we want to skip. It's, it's, listen, it's the hardest thing, right? As people, it, it's just, I think, you know, the more and more we get like this as a society, the harder it is for endurance sports because people want, um, people want everything now, you know, and we just get spoiled. Everything is so spoiled. Um, and you know, if you're if you're in if you're in the endurance game wanting you know an, an immediate you know impact and immediate resolution like you're in the wrong sport. But guess what? It's like that for all sports. <laughs> like you just gotta stick with it. The longer you do it, the more you do it, the better you get. And you have to stick with it. You know. Um, and I think that's that that's the hardest part, right? Is is to stick with it. You know, going throughout the season, the end of the season, the beginning of the season. It's you got you to see it through. And I think the closer you get to the end goal, the harder it is for people to stay focused on it. Um, but it's um, very, very crucial. And, uh, you know, it also, it's also, if you do it right, it's what makes the sport really, really gratifying to be able to achieve things over a long period of time. Um, and you, there's just a ton of value there that I think is gets lost a lot of times in the, in the impulse, I got to have it now. Uh, type of thing that, you know, we've all, you know, succumbed to in one way, shape or form. Yeah. I mean, there's one thing that I, I just thought of, like when you work on things, um, like for example, right now, 
what well I'll, uh, when I work on when I'm swimming, I have one thought, and it's just to stay high in the water. Or if I'm running, I want to be lighter, and I'm I'm working on that. Same with the bike, just to you know, well, how can I make this feel easier? What I'm doing, how do I make it feel easier? And I think a lot of times, you know, that sort of approach, at least for me, makes sense in the sense that you're going to figure out the the best form. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I spent a lot of time with that. And rather than always trying to like mechanically always put myself in the right position, I'm just trying to mentally be like, how do I make this feel easier? How do I stay high in the water? And then you start figuring it out. I mean, I don't have it down pat, but I'm just saying that's sort of how my process works. Yep. Yep. Totally agree. All right. Let's wrap it up. Wrap it up, man. It is a, uh, you know what? It's not a slim weekend, but the weekends are always busy these days. So if you're racing, have fun out there. Enjoy yourself. Uh, if you're traveling for Labor Day, get out there or have some fun. We hope there's a fall weather in sight for you and that it's uh, treating you, you know, treating you well. Um, and then next week, things pick up just a smidge. So as always, we love you guys. We appreciate you. Go to our website, c26triathlon.com. There's a one-stop shop for all things coaching camps and community. Uh, hey, if you're one of those people looking for a, for a customized plan for you, that's that's not orthodox, but it's just for you or coaching. Click on the coach tab or reach out uh, and uh, see if we can pair you with the right one. Uh, as always, Mike's available. Mike at c26triathlon.com. If you need anything from me specifically, Robbie at c26triathlon.com. One more day and we get to see the second iteration of Phil Longo's Air raid offense for the Wisconsin Badgers. Ooh, are you pumped? I'm very curious. Love it. Love it. Love it. Pressure love it. Is what's on. your before we go? What's your prediction for the um, for the Badgers this year? The season record. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm gonna say eight and four. Ooh, eight and four. Yeah, we got a tough schedule. Hmm. Um, I think our ceiling is uh, 10 wins. Yeah. I think we're, we're probably looking at, you know, I don't know. You guys gonna, are on the know, national title contention. Uh, no, no, we are definitely not. Oh, you're not? No, 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 no. No. It's your top 10 no. right now? I like no, where I'm we're at because we, we're not ranked. I'm going to say we only have two losses this year. If we come out of this year with only two losses – I think we had a great year, and, and 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 if we only have two losses, then and then we've let's we've got Georgia, Alabama, Oklahoma, you know, Florida, NC State. I mean, we, we're going to play like probably six or seven top twenty-five teams. So if if we only have two losses, then we're all then we're in the college football playoff. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. And so I think for us, a the uh, a pretty good season is three losses. Making it into the college football playoff would be a giant win for the for the school oh for sure yeah so we shall see first up old chattanooga yeah the I'm, upstairs I'm, I'm, I'm sure i think in the pregame they're gonna be talking about the new uh bike course oh, i'm sure, I'm sure yeah but it's just the, the sec network pregame they're gonna have about i think a five minute special on the outrage on the new ironman chattanooga um course well i it, think it, I, hopefully it, they'll start talking about the re Emergence of Rev Olympic on the in Knoxville. What? I'm just kidding. Oh, I was gonna, I was gonna say. I mean, you must be running low on power bars if you're trying to bring that back up. Yeah, <laughs> you try. You talk about a <laughs> hit race. That was mine, man. It was a little Olympic. Get things stirring, and things started falling into place. But then when they went to a half, I I got screwed. Too early. <laughs> Too was, early. Was that the half. year it rained the whole time? At the Olympic? Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I always had good Olympics down there, but when they when Chattanooga took them over and went to the half, it was a little tougher to get ready for oh, the half yeah. for me. That's right. By that time of year. Yeah. You got to make a trip back to Lake Logan at some point. <laughs> I think that's done. You think it's it, it doesn't exist anymore? Uh, I I thought I heard that either this was the last year or it was not coming back at all. Got it. Oh, yeah. I saw Lake Logan... Multi sports festival, multi multi sport festival discontinued. Mm. Sad. 
That's a shame. That was the day I swam with a ripped wetsuit. <laughs> <laughs> but that water was cold too. God bless. No, it wasn't. Remember you go under the bridge and then it went down like 30 degrees and that's when I cramped up. But anyway, I, I was getting getting ready and I ripped, pulled my wetsuit up and it just totally ripped on my thigh. And I'm like, oh, there's a big old <laughs> hole. And I was afraid I was going to drown, but it, it they work out fine with a little rip in it, just so you know. I had I had one of the greatest camaraderie uh, mid race sacrifices in that race that I was doing the seventy point three. It was so, so this is we're going on like a, to let twelve years ago. Andy Jones is out there, great athlete, uh, great dude, and uh, I I got a flat at like mile two, and he comes up behind me i mean maybe a minute later take my wheel what took his yeah took his wheel took his front wheel off handed it to me i was on my way in less than 90 seconds and what'd he do i think he just he called it a day he <laughs> said he wasn't feeling it it's like damn dude you're the man <laughs> everyone needs an andy jones in their life right there that that's true true teammate right there yeah a lot of people could have done that for me last year. <laughs> <laughs> you could have used, yeah, you could have used a lot of Andy Jones last year, but instead of by everybody, you know, rise. Here's my favorite thing on course. People ride by, they're already 10 feet past you. And they have no intention of stopping. They're like, are you good? You good. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, the fuck are you asking me if I'm good? You're not going to stop. You, you're not stopping. Mm -mm. Right. No chance. You know? Yeah. No chance. I kind of get it's it like, on a little bit of. <laughs> it's like it's like it's like when someone asks you to like, hey, you, do you? Uh, I got I got to move a couch in a few weeks. Do you mind helping? Like, oh yeah, but sure, man. You hit me up, and you're like, please, dear God, don't, please, dear God, don't ask, please, dear God. And then then the text comes, and then you don't read it, and then you only answer four hours later. You're like, oh, sorry, just seeing this man. I was out doing yard work. You still need help with the, and you grimace, yeah, hoping they've already got somebody. Like they couldn't wait on you. And then they come back with either the in the greatest gift of uh, in mankind. They're like, yeah, don't don't worry about it, man. You, I appreciate you being there for me, you know. But I, I got I got my neighbor to help me. Or you cringe and like your eyes squint and you're like waiting for the response and it comes through and it's like, oh no worries, bro. Just come on over whenever you're ready. And you're like, oh, I actually got to go do this. Like that's that's what people do when they when they roll on by and the hey you you good you good you need anything? <laughs> yeah, I need your front wheel. <laughs> no one's gonna, no one's gonna stop, and they're pr probably not gonna stop either, and give you a tube because then they're thinking, well, I might need, I might need this tube, and yeah. I don't want to stop. I mean, people use lose their like nutrition fueling bottle with like 500 calories in it, and they still don't stop for it because they don't want to lose 35 seconds in the race course. Mm. Yeah, but then they take 19 minutes in transition. So yeah, but that's it. That's all we love the sport. Yep. All right, man. All right, dude. I'll talk See to you next later. Sweet. See you.